CEC, CEO, everybody, as head of department uh, of the Material Science and Metallurgy. It's a very great pleasure to see so many of you here. We have um, Cambridge people, of course. We have SKF people. And we have to admit that inauguration or not, the UTC has in fact been operating for a little while. And so there are many people in the room who would be invidious to classify as Cambridge or SKF. They're very unitedly both. And we have friends in the room and supporters. And I have been informed that we even have some gentlemen of the press. Uh, please be assured we'll not be asking for any super injunctions today. Uh, rather, we'd like some super promotions for this uh, very important inauguration. Uh, SKF is, of course, Swedish in origin. Uh, my uh, colour of shirt and tie is meant to be a mild homage to Sweden. Um, uh, but of course, SKF is a um, global leader. And we would like to think that Cambridge is a global leader too. In fact, uh, Cambridge's leadership has a rather Swedish flavor since this institution has more Nobel Prizes than anywhere else in the world. Uh, so global leader and global leader, this very much captures the essence of the best with best collaboration that we seek. Uh, the university is very committed to its links with industry, and there's a great level of commitment to this UTC from the highest levels of the university. And those levels are embodied in the form of our Vice Chancellor here with us today. So thank you very much, Sir Leszek, for coming along. And I will, in fact, hand over now to Sir Leszek Borysiewicz to introduce our inaugural ceremonies. Sir Leszek. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here on what's a very, very special occasion for the university as a whole, not just for the department. And on behalf of the whole university, I'd like to add my own welcome to our visitors and my congratulations to all concerned in this splendid initiative. It's invidious to actually quote somebody who's actually sitting in the audience, but I will, and I hope I get it right. Because Harry Badesha has written, and I'm told this is correct, so it's there, he wrote, it is sometimes said that collaborative research with industrial partners can be limited in scope when compared with that funded by research councils. On the contrary, our experience suggests that such work done in combination with an enlightened industrial partner informs academic work. That is, it inspires theories and science which may not otherwise have been conceived. The outcomes may then result in a tangible product or a disruptive technology. And I can't put it better myself. I think Harry has encapsulated all of it as to why these relationships really matter. So let's just consider for a moment what conditions are necessary for what Harry envisages to actually happen. Well, there are conditions that the university partner must actually achieve and must meet in order to make this work. Firstly, I think it's inherent in the university partner to be absolutely imbued with a commitment to the spirit of discovery. Secondly, I believe it has to encompass a breadth of discipline. That is, intelligent and relevant breadth, bringing the strength of the whole university to bear, often on the problems and issues that are being tackled. Thirdly, and an element that I absolutely believe in, it has to have strength in its basic fundamental research so that new conjectures are rooted in th a thorough understanding. They don't just come out of left field by happenstance. They're built and established on a strong foundation. And fourthly, it has to have an inherent culture of technology transfer. And that means it has to have a belief in the value of putting academic research to work in industry, and a sophisticated system to allow that to happen. <coughs> in this university, we are very fortunate to have Cambridge Enterprise, which is enormously experienced and committed to intelligent and sensitive exploitation of academic research for the greater good. And we're fortunate, too, in our many thousands of links with companies in the Cambridge cluster more widely, which give the whole university community a context in which to understand the benefits of such activity. But most importantly, we have staff who do not see 
a contradistinction between the idea of entrepreneurship and engagement with industry and discovery. And that actually is a value that's inherent in the university. If you haven't got that, I'll tell you what, it's going to take you an awful lot of time, effort and money to discover it. It is important and it's why staff here are very special indeed. So let's turn the coin the other way around for a second. And then ask the question, what does the university seek in an enlightened industrial partner? Well, firstly, I, I'm a strong believer in an agreement that allows for an open interface, that you don't have locked doors between the two partners so that you can really work freely, because that's what I believe and where I believe academics can make their, their greatest contribution. Secondly, an understanding that a link to a department is a gateway to the whole university. No one department in this institution, believe me, I, I'm going to be inventing a new parlour game, which is sometimes you might have played it yourself, was after a, a very late night trying to work out what all the 50 states of the United States are and to write them all out. Well, I've got an even greater challenge for you. Write out the 150 institutes, units and departments of the University of Cambridge, because that is actually what a partner, an industrial partner, buys into. It's that breadth of coverage and excellence that extends far beyond a single department. Thirdly, I think an enlightened partner will allow academics to be free thinkers, not lock them into a contract-driven relationship. Yes, results are vital, and in this day and age, more vital than ever for a company. But an academic partner is not just an agent or a tool for a job. You can get plenty of those, and believe me, I know they're probably cheaper than uh, academics in many ways. <laughs> the partner will understand that productive ideas come from left field. And boy, have we got some great academics who keep thinking and looking in the left field. And fourthly, above all, the best industrial partner is open to a long-term and very meaningful relationship. Now, it goes without saying, I wouldn't be standing here if I really didn't believe that this is all gloriously true of Cambridge's relationship with SKF. At the height of the financial crisis, SKF chose to place a long-term investment in Cambridge to help develop new steels for the needs of the future. That's visionary. The UTC concept embodies the long-term nature of the relationship and allows for broad engagement within the academic community and with other industrial partners such as Rolls-Royce and Tata Steel. So I'm going to take this opportunity on behalf of the university, and that means Lindsay has to deliver it, to reassure SKF, and I don't think you need that reassurance, that you've chosen, well, I have to say one of the best departments, if not the best department, in the, and it says in my notes here, in the best university in the UK. No, in the best university in the world, because that's, if we are not there already, we will always aspire to be. And your partner in this venture, and I look forward to all the successes that I know are going to emanate from this interaction. Thank you and we look forward to a long, happy and productive relationship that is productive both for the industry and for us as academics. Thank you very much indeed. Well, continuing on our partnership theme, I'll hand over next to Tom Johnson, the CEO of SKF. Tom. Thank you very much indeed, Vice-Chancellor, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, many customer partners. It's great to be here in Cambridge. It's great to be here to officially inaugurate the first SKF University Technology Centre that we established. As Lindsay pointed out already, it, uh, it's already been working. So this is a formal baptism of something that's already working, and I can already say providing good and uh, strong cooperation between both SKF and the University. Uh, SKF was founded on an innovation over 100 years ago, an innovation of the self-aligning ball bearing. Our uh, founder, Sven Winkles, tackled a major challenge in his company, Whipton, the textile company, to be able to take misalignment in the, in the factory. The factory was built on clay, and they had to come up with a solution to that because they were replacing too many bearings. 
there. Whether they were, wherever they were manufactured, they were going through too, too, too quickly. And he invented the self-aligning ball bearing. And I've got to say, since that invention in 1907, SKF has been the leader in bringing new bearing types to the industry over the last 100 years. Today, SKF is a truly global company. We have activities in 130 countries around the world. We employ some 45,000 people in the world. We have 130 factories in 32 countries. And we have a turnover today of around £6 billion, pounds, depending where the currency rate is at any moment in time. Uh, they're around £6 billion. Pounds. So really, a truly, truly a global company. If you look at our sales, we have today 46% of our sales in Europe, but 27% of the SKF Group's sales are now in Asia. Asia has doubled as a percent of the group's sales in the last eight years. Gone from 13% to 27%. At the same time as our sales has increased by 50%. So a tripling of our business in Asia. So 27% of our sales are in Asia today. 25% of our employees. 24% of our fixed assets. Asia is a very, very important area for us and will continue to be uh, going forward. The third geography for SKF is uh, North America, which is 18% of the sales. You know, and I take great delight when, when I go to America and talking to our employees in America and telling them, Americans, you're now number three. You're number three in the world. You normally used to be number one uh, in the world. And I actually, when I look at the, the rankings of markets, Germany and, uh, Germany and USA are the two largest markets for SKF, followed by China because China is roughly 13% of SKF group tunnel. And I keep telling our American colleagues, the Chinese are going to take over your position as the leading market, one of the leading markets for the SKF group. Then, and I say, there's Americans, you can't have that happen. Then I go to China, and I say to our team in China, the Americans are not going to let you take over the number one position there. And what is behind our leadership that we've got and this drive that we must continue to, to develop? And that is about innovation. It's right back to how we were founded. We were founded on an innovation. And innovation is very important for the SKF group and becoming even more important. Just uh, shortly, Alan Begg will go through in a lot more detail what we're doing in the field of research and development in the SKF group and how important innovation is for SKF. Now, most of you in the room who know SKF knows SKF as the world leader in rolling bearings. But SKF is today much more than rolling bearings. We're not only the world leader in rolling bearings, we're also a leader in the supply of seals and sealing systems. We're a leader in electronic systems, in mechanical services and, and asset efficiency services, and also a leader in lubrication systems and automated lubrication systems. These five technology areas are core to the SKF group and are areas we're investing in. And they're all about managing and reducing friction. In today's world, energy efficiency is increasingly important for our customers and increasingly important for us and to address climate change, increasingly important for our children in the future. We in SKF are investing heavily in energy efficiency, in our operations, but also in developing new products, new solutions, new services that will help our customers be more energy efficient in their business. We're developing new products, which in their own right can reduce energy consumption, or let's say energy loss in the product by at least 30%. We're also developing new products that are part of systems which enables either more environmentally friendly energy generation or more environmentally friendly energy use. For example, SKF have an advanced bearing with a sensor attached to it, a sensorised unit, which is fitted in this, the Valio stop-start system, which can reduce fuel consumption in a car by between 25 and 35% in urban driving. Our product in its own right cannot do that, but our product is an integral part of the system. And being an integral part of a system and understanding the interactions between 
the different components of the system is key to what is our vision. Our vision is to equip the world with SKF knowledge. And knowledge is about understanding your products, but also how your products interact in so many different applications and areas, and what advantages you can bring to, to our customers. As I said, our, our vision is to equip the world with SKF knowledge, to take our knowledge for the last 100 years and help our customers be more successful in their business through using SKF knowledge than through using someone else's knowledge. Now, key to that knowledge is not just the system, but also to be able to continually to invest in knowledge within our products. And clear, uh, as I said earlier, SKF is a world leader in bearing, so clearly steel is a critical part for SKF, for, of our products, of, of the business at SKF. SKF used to be one of the leading specialist steel manufacturers. We no longer manufacture our own steel. But I can tell you we have a huge interest in the development of steels, in the development of heat treatment, and how they can help us develop new products, new solutions for our customers. When we were looking how we could uh, continue to invest in the development of steels, one of the ideas that both Alan and I came up with was to look and say, how can we find partnerships to help further develop our technology in very many areas, not just in steel, but in other areas? How can we find partnerships and who should be the right partner uh, to enable us to continue to lead the innovation in our business? We started with steel, and from that viewpoint, it was obvious we should come to the University of Cambridge so that we could link in to not only the, the knowledge you have here, but link in to the expertise, the network that you have here, and help us develop or further strengthen our leadership in the bearing business and in the materials. I see the Vice Chancellor very eloquently went through many of the reasons for partnerships between universities and business. For me, I see three big reasons for us working with the University of Cambridge. Firstly, access, access to knowledge, access to excellent knowledge, expertise in the field of uh, materials, uh, steel materials. Secondly, we want to get increased access and visibility to the students of the University of Cambridge to raise the visibility of SKF. For many, many people, SKF is a hidden company. We touch people's lives every single day of the year. In a normal household, you can have up to 130 SKF bearings or products, but you never see them, and hopefully you never hear them. <laughs> but we're invisible. We need to raise our visibility much more in the marketplace and much more in universities so that we can attract and retain, bring people from universities into SKF to help us continue to grow our business. So firstly, access to your outstanding knowledge. Secondly, access to the visibility that you get with the students. Thirdly, access to the major partnerships you've got, the network that you have. I see these as three good reasons for us to work here with the University of Cambridge. What does SKF bring? I think, yes, of course, a world leader in our business, but that's not enough. That is that's looking backwards. I think what we can bring is access to over 40 different industries that we work with around the world. We are active in industries, whether it be aerospace or mining, medical, wind energy, food and beverage, paper making, many, many different industries. Industries with very, very different requirements, different performance requirements, different commercial uh, requirements there. That knowledge we can bring in, I think, and help further develop your studies and further develop the knowledge that you have. Secondly, our knowledge of being a truly, truly global company and operating in so many countries around the world. It's interesting to note that when SKF was 25 years old, that was in 1932, we were operating in 40 countries around the world. 40 countries by 1932. There wasn't Boeing 747s or Airbuses to travel at that time. I must say, as a CEO uh, of, of the group who likes keeping on top of what's going on 
in the company. I don't know how you manage the company without internet, without mobile phones, to get access to what the sales figures were yesterday or the day before. You didn't get that for months. It must have been quite a challenging time there at these times. But that knowledge of working in different markets we can bring in to the partnership at the University of Cambridge. I also believe we have a lot of outstanding experts in materials within the SKF group and within modelling in the SKF group. And that combination, I think, is a real win-win. That's why we are delighted that Cambridge was the first ever university technology centre that we agreed in SKF. And we're delighted with the cooperation and the progress that we have already seen. But to be honest, one of uh, my, uh, let's say patience is not one of my virtues uh, there. So I'm, uh, whilst I love research and I love research and development, I also love another word starting with R, which is results. Uh, about there. So I can assure you, Harry, I can assure you, Lindsay, and I can assure you, Alan, that I will continue to look and see what results we can get out of this close cooperation, this University Technology Centre. Because building knowledge is very important. Building expertise is very important. Getting results from that knowledge and expertise is the proof that you're doing the right things together. I am convinced that the partnership between the University of Cambridge and the SKF Group will be a winning partnership, not only for the two institutions, but also for the people involved in it. And I'm delighted to be here today at this very, very special occasion in the inauguration of the University Technology Centre here in Cambridge. And I'd like to ask the Vice-Chancellor back up so that I can give him the official plaque that you can put on the wall. <laughs> So, this is uh, to put up for the University Technology Centre for Steels, and uh, we can together watch its development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Tom, for that um, inspirational introduction to SKF. Uh, and I think it's given a heavy burden to Alan to carry on the torch uh, as Director of Research at SKF. Alan, of course, I, and I go way back. Um, we were co-members of a certain part two class in material science in this university. Uh, and uh, we have signed a super injunction on tails against each other today. <laughs> so since that has deprived me of all the content of my speech, I will simply hand over to Alan to do his job on introducing I can see the title here, and I'll let you do it yourself. Thank you. Alan. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, I'm very honoured and pleased to be back here. I think the first time I sat in this, uh, in this conference room or this lecture theatre uh, was probably my very first lecture ever in Cambridge University, some Monday morning at 9 o'clock, I suppose. Um, so it's, uh, it's good to be back on the other side of the, of the stage. Um, you probably think that everybody that works for SKF is a Scotsman now. I assure you that the S at the beginning of SKF stands for Swedish rather than Scottish. Um, I assure you there are lots of Swedes that work for the company as well. Um, as an engineer, I can't do a talk without PowerPoint. I, I admire all my colleagues who've gone before me who, uh, who can uh, talk without any, any form of artificial stimulation and aid. Uh, I'm afraid I'm a humble engineer and can't do that. What I'd like to, uh, to talk to you about uh, this afternoon, I'd like to cover five issues with you. First of all, I'd like to talk about SKF, and we, and we, we badge SKF as the knowledge engineering company. And I'd like to give you some insight in terms of, of, of what I believe that means for, for us as engineers and material scientists. Secondly, I'd like to talk about the changing focus of research and development within SKF. Then I'd like to give you some insights on key competences, and I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll understand that the first of those key competences very much is steel and heat treatment. I'd like to move that on into talking about some new developments that have been going on within SKF in, uh, uh, in recent years. And then finally, uh, talk a bit about our programme of university technology centres, of which this is uh, the first, and, uh, and certainly at this stage in time, the largest. So let's talk about SKF as the knowledge engineering company. SKF's strapline, SKF's vision, is to equip the world with SKF knowledge. 
What does that mean? What does that mean to, to, to me as head of technology? What does that mean to our engineering activities, uh, our engineers across the company? Well, I think for me, first of all, it says something very clear. It says we are not, and we do not aspire to be the lowest cost producer. SKF in its 100 years of history has aspired to be the best and has achieved the position that it's in today by being the best. Now, being the best means differentiating from others, differentiating your product, differentiating your service, differentiating your ability to meet market requirements. Technology is only one differentiator. I, I hope I'm not the only one in the room that thinks it's quite the most important and certainly the clearest one for the customer in terms of differentiator. It's certainly the one that, that I'm most focused on. And for SKF, technology leadership is certainly absolutely key. We badge ourselves the knowledge engineering company. If any of you ever come and see us in Gothenburg, the first thing you will see on the way out of Gothenburg Airport is a very large stainless steel ball with written right at the bottom of it, SKF, the knowledge engineering company. And people even within SKF ask me, what, what do you mean by knowledge engineering company? And I've developed this way of, of, of trying to explain it. As, as, as Tom alluded earlier, we, we are, we're moving up, we're providing, we're going from providing components to assembling those components together to designing systems to offering solutions and services. We're moving up that staircase. We're doing it really pretty, pretty blatantly to chase the extra reward that we can get for doing that. To chase the extra value that the customer places in our ability to be able to do that. But what I keep saying to my colleagues is this is not an easy, obvious path. Moving up this staircase actually involves a bit of risk. And clearly, you don't want to take risk. So what's the solution to not taking the risk? It all comes down to knowledge. It all comes down to having the knowledge required to go safely up this staircase. And for me, that's the three R's of being a knowledge engineering company. Chasing the reward, we're a commercial company, we want to maximize our profits, we want to chase that reward. We certainly don't want to take the risk. And the only way to mitigate that risk is to have the required knowledge and the ability to do that job effectively, reliably, and safely. So those for me, three hours of the knowledge engineering company and, and, and one of our reasons for being here today, generating the required knowledge to make sure we can be the successful knowledge engineering company. Tom talked about our platforms. We're well known uh, as a variance company. Uh, I think if you say SKF to most engineers, they instantly say variance. But we're much more than a variance company. We market ourselves today, we think in terms of technology today in five platforms. Any, any, any good variance guy will tell you variance never fail. They'll tell you that, uh, that actually it, it's the lubrication for the bearing that fails. Uh, if you, if you uh, run a bearing as you should do and you trap an oil fill between the rolling element and the ring, then the two pieces of metal never touch each other. And if they never touch each other, then they can't really do each other any harm. Slight of a simplification, but, but broadly it's not far off being true. So the true bearing expert will tell you that uh, bearings never fail, it's the lubrication system that fails. And so we've made ourselves experts in lubrication systems. And as Tom alluded to earlier, we've bought our way into providing lubrication systems equipment and lubrication system services to our customers. Of course, the lubricant guys don't like taking the blame for this. The lubricant guys will tell you, lubricants never fail. What fails is this thing, it's the seal. You know, the seal fails, the lubricant drips out, and then the whole bearing fails. So, these top three really all go together. You can't be good at this without being good at the other two. What about the two at the bottom then, the two underpinning ones? Mechatronics. What do we mean by mechatronics? Well, mechatronics, we mean the combination 
got mechanical things and electronics in it. SKF, of, of course, is really well known as a precision engineering company. Not so many people think of us as an advanced electronics company. I think it would surprise most of you, I suspect it would surprise most of you, to know that SKF manufactures 5% of the world's fly-by-wire aircraft systems. I don't think electronics gets all that much more sophisticated and, uh, and, and safety critical than a fly-by-wire system. We design and manufacture 5% of the world's fly-by-wire systems. And as Tom alluded to earlier, we increasingly add that electronic functionality to our precision mechanical systems. That's what we really mean by mechatronics within the SKF group. And then finally, services. Uh, we supply services to help our customers use our products in the most effective way. And we've taken that further in terms of providing our customers with the opportunity and the support to use a whole range of mechanical plant that are started in terms of vibration analysis, vibration analysis and machine bearings. Telling what's beginning to go wrong with the bearing, but if you're doing vibration analysis in the bearing, you can do it in the whole system and say what's going on in other parts of the system besides the bearing. And we've taken that vibration analysis to much wider. So we now provide a whole reliability maintenance system to our customers, a fast growing part of our business. And as Tom said earlier, the whole of this is really about managing and reducing friction. And that in today's world is getting more and more and more critical and more and more valuable to our customers. So, research and development. What do we spend, first of all, on research and development? Uh, Tom promised me when I joined SDF that we spend 20% per year more on research and development. And, and uh, partly as a, as a function of, of exchange rate, and partly as a function perhaps of, of uh, uh, the activities that we were doing, we talked by rather more than that uh, in my first year in SKF. 2009, uh, the world hit major, major problems. Uh, as Tom said, we were in December 2008 uh, at the point of being ready to sign this agreement on the University Technology Centre here. And I well remember the pressure that we were on budgets then. And I went to see Tom and I said, Tom, the next thing I've got to cut is this University Technology Centre. And he said to me, but Alan, you told me this was the most strategic thing we had to do. And I said, yes, I did. He said, have you changed your mind? And I said, no. I said, well, what are you here for? Go do it. I've worked for a lot of GPT entities in my time. I don't know how long we would have done that. I don't know another company that I worked for that would have done that. So, in 2009, the world went through major recession. And I'm, and I'm proud to say we didn't make a single engineer in the group government. We held our spend, we held our activity. I didn't get my 20% increase, but I knew that was pushing my luck given the, uh, given the size of the downturn of the world face at that stage. We're, we're moving back towards our 20% increase. Uh, in fact, exchange rate affects these quite, quite severely. We were actually not that far off 20% in real terms. We were about 10% in, in 2010. Uh, and very nearly 20% in 2011. The Swedish Kroner has been appreciating like mad, and when you look at this in terms of our annual reports, which is what these results are based on, it actually takes down the, uh, the apparent spend uh, over it. So what are we focusing on? Well, SKF is very heavily focused and driven by environment, by sustainability. Biggest issue facing the world. You can see it as a problem, or you can see it as an opportunity. In SKF, we see it as an opportunity. An opportunity to develop products to help people to maximize the benefit of their mechanical equipment. We see it as an opportunity to look at our own operations and reduce the carbon footprint, reduce the energy requirements of our own operations. We're increasingly focusing on core technologies, focusing our efforts.